Okay, so we have uh, arrived at the third letter of John in our study of the, the John letters. And we're going to be looking this morning at verses 1 to 8. And this is what they say. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testify to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. So, as you can see, this passage starts the elder to the beloved Gaius. So, who are the elder and the beloved Gaius? You may recall that commonly biblical letters start by saying who they're from. So, in this instance, the elder is John, the writer of the letter. But who is Gaius? This is the first time that we've met this character. So, at the moment, we don't know anything about him. And actually, our knowledge of him isn't about to increase very much as we read through the letter. All we can really say for sure is that Gaius is someone whom John knows and loves, is a member of the church, and perhaps most importantly, is someone who is renowned for his hospitality. Now, by way of background to understanding the importance of hospitality, let's turn to Luke's Gospel and chapter 10, verses 1 to 7 where it says this. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. Do not take a purse, or bag, or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Now, this action was one of the very first evangelical missions to take the gospel of Jesus Christ out into the world and establish a network of churches. Now, Jesus sends out the 72 with strict instructions. Don't take a purse or bag or sandals. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you. Jesus was telling the disciples, don't take any provisions, but be entirely dependent upon the hospitality of brothers and sisters in the faith to provide for you. Now, Gaius was one of these brothers in the faith. Gaius was one of the people who opened their homes to the disciples who were spreading the gospel. The role of people like Gaius shouldn't be underestimated. Listen to how John describes the role of those who offer hospitality to the missions. It is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers. And we ought to support people like these, that they may be fellow workers for the truth. Do you know that phrase, fellow workers, speaks volumes to me? Countless times I've stood before you all when I'm heading off to Bulgaria with one group or another, and asked for prayer, stating that it is important to go, but it is more important to pray. I've testified so often to the fact that it is only because of those people who stay home and faithfully pray that the missions are successful. The people who pray are fellow workers with those who go. 
And you may recall that I generally define three groups of people who are fellow workers in the mission, those who go, those who pray, and those who give. So naturally, those who give are also fellow workers in the mission. I, th I think this is really important, and, and we need to stop and just dwell on it for a moment. Now, as you know, we are interspersing our traditional preaching with our Faith in Action series and hearing of all the marvellous things that people in our own church family are doing in the power and the name of God. But it's important to remember that behind each person, there are people who are praying and people who are giving, fellow workers in the mission. And whilst one of the constant challenges we hear is, if you get the chance to go, then you should go, let me add to that, that if you get the chance to give, then you should give. And if you get the chance to pray, you should pray. And let's face it, we all get the chance to pray. Those who go, those who give, and those who pray, all working in perfect harmony as fellow workers for the Lord. But we need to listen carefully to what God is calling us to do, to go or to give, or to pray. Going can be quite scary and sometimes we can be guilty of taking giving or praying as the easier option. Now of course God does call people to give and he does call people to pray and each are of paramount importance in his work. But I'm challenging you to listen carefully and make sure that it is God who is calling you to give or pray and not your fear of going. So just to make sure I'm clear on this point, Gaius was not one of the missionaries who went from place to place preaching the gospel. He was one of the brothers who opened his home to the missionaries so that they could share the gospel. But he was faithful in all his efforts and he was a fellow worker for the truth. Goers, givers and prayers, all fellow workers for the truth. Let's have a look at verse two. It says this, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. And I'd like to explore in a little more detail the bit which says that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. John is stating here that all is well with Gaius's soul. It's a bold statement, but as we've already learned from our study of John's writing, the fruit of our lives demonstrates the health of our soul. You may remember from John's first letter, chapter two, verses three to six. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Gaius is living out his faith in such a way that it is obvious to John that all is well with his soul. How about you? And how about me? When people look at us, at the way we live our lives, can they see that all is well with our soul? But back to Gaius. All is well with his soul, and that's great. But what about his body? Remember, John said, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you will be in good health as it goes well with your soul. John's prayer is that Gaius's body enjoys good health as well as his soul. Now, Given that our bodies are temporary and it's our souls which enter eternal life, why is John concerned with Gaius's physical health? If his soul is well, what does it matter if his temporary body is in poor shape? Will a dodgy body prevent Gaius from entering heaven? Well, no, of course not. So why does John place such importance on Gaius having good physical health as he has good spiritual health? Well, the answer is very straightforward. 
If Gaius was in poor health, how would he be able to offer the critical hospitality to the missionaries? Without Gaius, the missionaries would have no food, no water, no shelter, and the mission would grind to a halt. Without this fellow worker, there would be no mission. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 20 to 26. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honourable, we bestow the greater honour. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honour to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. So Gaius's good health is so important to the success of the ministry. And there's a lesson to us all here. Are we looking after our physical health so that when the Lord calls, we're ready to respond? Once we're walking with the Lord and all is well with our souls, then we should be paying strict attention to the health of our bodies. Now, there are many ways in which we can abuse our body's health. There's gluttony, there's substance abuse, uh, liver damage from excess drinking, lung damage from excess smoking. The list is endless. And if we do this, then we put ourselves at risk of not being able to respond to God's call when it comes. Now, let's just be clear. I'm talking about self-inflicted ill health. Many of us will have any manner of ill health issues that are not self-inflicted, and I'm not talking about this. What I am saying is that we have a responsibility to keep our bodies in the best shape possible so that we can respond to God's call on our lives. Or think of it this way. God may have an amazing job for someone, the job of a lifetime, and he's looking around for someone to give it to. Well, don't rule yourself out of the list of candidates because you have neglected your body and you're not fit enough to do the job. Your body is part of God's creation, a very special part which God created specifically for you. Isaiah 44, 24, thus says the Lord, your redeemer, who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. And in Psalm 139, verse 14, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And consider this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. The Holy Spirit lives within your body. What kind of home do you wish to create for the Holy Spirit to dwell in? How do you care for the body where the Holy Spirit dwells? The body which God lovingly created specifically for you. You may have given your life to Christ. All may be well with your soul, but that is not an excuse to neglect the body. Keep it trimmed and ready for God's call. And one final thought on keeping in good physical shape for God, rest and sleep. You're not going to be able to respond to God's call if you're exhausted or overstressed or run down. Keep up your energy levels by pausing from time to time to get the right amount of rest and sleep. But what if God's call is for you to give or to pray? 
The same applies. Keep your finances in good order as far as you are able, so that if a call comes to help financially, you can respond. Be careful not to squander what God has given you. So when God asks you to give, all you can do is point to a pile of discarded ready meal cartons in your bin or a glut of unused gadgets in the cupboard under your stairs. That's one good reason to give of your first fruits. That way you don't end up with money which you can waste. Proverbs 3 verse 9, honour the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. And just let me add to that a scripture that we just read in Corinthians. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom God, whom, sorry, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Do you see how we are called to glorify God in our bodies and to honour the Lord with our wealth? Sometimes in our Christian culture, we see our wealth and our bodies as something dirty, something opposed to our Christian values and treat them with dishonour. But look at what the scripture says. Glorify God in your body. Honour the Lord with your wealth. Can we glorify God and honour the Lord with things which are dirty? No. Oh, but we can make them dirty. Of course we can. If we love our wealth or our bodies more than Jesus, then we make them dirty. And conversely, if we despise our bodies or consider wealth to be from the enemy, then we make them dirty. And we cannot bring that which is dirty to glorify God or honour the Lord. Do not take something which God has given you and make it dirty. Instead, take it. Use your body to glorify God. Use your wealth to honour the Lord. So we've talked about keeping our bodies in good condition and about keeping our finances in good condition. That's going and giving covered. But what about praying? Well, we need to keep spiritually fit too. The more we pray, the more we know how to pray. The more we pray, the more answers we see to prayer and so are encouraged to pray more. If God called you to pray, what good would it be if you said, I don't know how to pray? But let's face it, nobody can say they don't know how to pray. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 9, this then is how you should pray. And he went on to teach us that prayer that we now know as the Lord's Prayer. Jesus has given us the words to say. It couldn't be any easier. This is where we start when learning to pray. Then, as we pray more, so we learn to pray more. 1 Timothy 6.11 But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Well, why pursue righteousness? Well, as James tells us, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And I just want to close by reading this parable from Matthew 25. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. 
But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So let's sit up and take notice of this parable. Keep your lamps ready with oil. So when the Lord comes calling, you are ready to respond. Keep your bodies as healthy as is within your control. Keep your finances in good order. Keep spiritually active. So when the Lord comes calling, you are ready to go or ready to give or ready to pray. Amen.